Welcome to another glorious day here on the Glorious Sunrise Podcast. This is episode two. My name is Kevin from Mitt Resolves. I'm joined by... John from Channel yes. Country Thrive. <laughs> we did it this time. Heck yeah, yes. Right? Uh, yeah, we kind of messed that up the first time, but it's all good. Well, I'm glad you said we. I like that, man. But I, yeah, hey, it was maybe a, a singular. <laughs> nah, dude. Team effort all the way. Guys, welcome back to, like I said, episode two of the Glorious Sunrise podcast. This is the magic podcast where we talk anything and everything magic. We're focusing a lot on Streets of New Capenna right now, naturally. Uh, obviously, just came out uh, as of Thursday, I think, on Arena. Uh, and so uh, with that in mind, we thought we'd both take a look at some deck ideas that we really, really liked, uh, maybe even built our own and kind of work through that and talk through those those two deck lists. So we've each taken some time to do that. Uh, before we jump into that, though, I do want to remind you, if you happen to be watching on YouTube, a couple of things. First of all, you can follow the podcast on both Apple Podcasts and Spotify. So if you want to stay up to date there, you can certainly do so. If you happen to be listening in your car or whatever, uh, you can do it there. Uh, we do actually incorporate questions on Spotify as well. So we've got a little question down below. I have no clue what it's going to be yet because we haven't planned ahead that well. Uh, but that's okay. Uh, also, for this episode, as I said, we are going to be talking through some deck ideas. Both of those deck lists are going to be linked down below. So mine will be down there. We'll talk about that one first, and then we'll work over uh, to Country Frieds, and we'll, we'll talk about that one. So you can follow along as you would like. But before all of that, how you doing, buddy? I'm doing great, man. I'm doing great. I appreciate it. Now, nah, man, the week's good. The week's good. I'm super excited to hop into this. We've been doing card reviews on our channel. And uh, yeah, man, everybody in my community is ready for streets to hit uh, standard a little still. So uh, getting something, I don't know if it's as powerful as Neon Dynasty, but I think it's just as wide. So definitely looking, uh, looking forward to uh, building up some deck lists with this. I love it. And I think you're exactly right. And I think, um, you know, something that we'll see as a bit of a motif through this episode uh, with the two deck lists that we put together is that the flexibility that we have with these deck lists, I think, is a little bit further on than it was in like Kamigawa, as an example. Kamigawa had a lot of really powerful cards, as you mentioned, uh, a lot of powerful strategies that came out of that set as well. I think we're going to have some powerful strategies here, but I also think the decks aren't going to be quite so rigid. I think we're going to have a lot more flexibility in terms of the flex slots that you see in decks. You know, if you're playing a three color deck, there's a lot more options. So uh, I think as time goes on, hopefully uh, we won't have a standard environment that's quite as stale as Kamigawa ended up being. I mean, that always happens towards the end of a cycle, so it's not it's not surprising. That's not even really a, a hit to Kamigawa. Uh, but my hope is that we can kind of continue to push new deck lists and things like that with a lot more flexibility, a lot more color incorporation uh, into a larger scale deck. So we'll see how that goes as we go along. But uh, I think we'll jump right in, uh, if, if you're cool with that, if you're cool with jumping in. Yeah, man. Nope. I agree with everything you said. I, I would touch on. Like I said, I'd never spend, uh, I'd never tell people spend on wild cards, but I think you hit it right there, man, with the uh, color flexibility and the triomes. If you've never played with them, get used to them. Yep, absolutely correct. I think we'll see those will fit into most, I mean, any three color deck that can run those triomes will run those triomes. Uh, I think you're going to see a lot more possible splashes and things like that. And even in the deck list that I've put together, I know um, uh, it, to, to spoil things a little bit, I kind of went with the Riveteer uh, or Jund color combination. So we've got red, green, and black. Black is much more of a splash in this deck than um, I would traditionally run it. And so we'll, we'll talk about that as we go through. Um, all right, so... I'm going to flash this up on the screen. This is the deck list. Uh, however, I'm not going to flash cards up individually as we go through. So um, if you want to follow along again, the, the link is in the description to the Aether Hub uh, deck list. You can go there, export it, follow along, try it out. I don't know. Do all the things. <laughs> uh, I'm going to take this kind of slot by slot. So we're going to take this in terms of CMC. So I'm going to start at one and kind of work my way up. Before I do that, I will say, as I said, this is a Riveteer deck. This is a treasure-focused deck. So a couple of things that I was kind of trying to keep in mind here as the main themes of the deck is to create, A, 
a crap ton of treasure tokens. This deck has the capability, in my opinion, to really do that. Now, I'm saying that having not had the opportunity to test because we're well ahead of the curve on this one and we haven't had that chance yet, but uh, it really does create a lot of treasure tokens. On top of that, I wanted to be able to play more and more cards as you get into the mid to late game. We'll talk about how the deck does that as we go through. Uh, but to kick us off in the one drop slot, a pretty basic one. We've got uh, voltage, sur voltage Surge. I can speak, I swear. Uh, a really nice little flexible removal spell that works great in this deck. Instant one mana. You're not having to spend a lot to do it. If you've got an extra treasure token, it leaves that flexibility up throughout the game. Uh, and this also scales throughout the game, in my opinion. So in the early turns, you can shock something, either a creature or planeswalker, which is super helpful. Uh, and then if you would like to, you can sacrifice an extra treasure token uh, to, to up it to four damage. Uh, and that, to me, is a really nice flexible play because, again, you've got a lot of big heavy-duty Planeswalkers in the format right now. We still are going to see things like Loth, Obnixilis, stuff like that. Uh, we'll talk about Obnixilis later on. Um, and it, it helps to be able to instant speed deal with all of those things. Uh, there's not a ton of removal in this deck, but I did want to have that accessible. And so I think that was the best option. Are there any, like... Because you you know really well like the jank stuff and the you know the stuff that you put into decks is very clever. So my question to you as we're talking through this, and I'll ask you kind of cue you up for things here. Um, mm -hmm. Did I miss a, a removal spell that you think works better in treasure than voltage surge, or do you feel that might be just the most flexible option there? No. So after going over your deck list here in completion and people will start seeing it as it forms up here for them, um, or if they're just following along, I think that's probably the correct removal for this one. It's okay. uh, it's going to be super flexible for you, pretty easy to fire off. And uh, no, no. Good. Okay. I like it. I just want to make sure because, again, I think uh, you're much more of a deck builder than I am. I did build this deck, but you're much more of that deck you've got that mind for it and so oh, i was i was curious there i'm building you up <laughs> don't, don't underestimate yourself man you're actually making me think about my removal in my deck list now oh good <laughs> so, I, I love doing that um there you go perfect well uh again that that felt like the best option for me and so i think that's a pretty easy starting point now moving that is our only one drop card now moving into the two drop side of things we've got uh, one of the cards that we mentioned on our previous episode uh, as one of our top picks in green, we have Gala Greeters, uh, and we're actually utilizing this with Prosperous Innkeeper. Now, Prosperous Innkeeper, we've had around for quite a while. This is going to introduce a life gain sub theme to the deck, which I think is relatively important just to keep yourself in that game long term. Ideally, you're going to be playing extra spells uh, throughout the deck as, as you get to that mid to late game. Uh, and as as long as those are creatures, <laughs> uh, you want to be gaining some life and buffering that life total as you go. So early early game, you really want to get the Innkeeper or that Gala Greeter down, both of which gain you life. Uh, the Gala Greeter obviously has some extra upside. You can throw a 1-1 counter on it and create treasure tokens with it. Uh, now that is only once each turn. However, uh, it's I, I think something that uh, you you want is, again, that big flexible play and getting that early... Uh, really sets you up for a, a, a positive or, or a takeover later on in the game where you can start playing extra stuff, uh, buffering that life total, or just have a big threat. So for me, those are pretty obvious two drops. I don't think I missed anything too crazy there in the two drop slot. Uh, not for this deck, but I, again, I could be wrong. No, no, no. I like both of them in this spot. Uh, spot. However, when you said Gala Greeters, you only get to choose one per turn. Yeah. Um, just so nobody misinterprets that. If you drop a Zika's Chariot in there and you drop the two cat uh, creatures on the on the battlefield, you get to you get to select two of those. Yes. Options within that turn, you only get to select one of those three per turn. Yes. Exactly. Just to clarify. Yes. Good. Good call. No, thank <laughs> you. I right. do appreciate. It. That's why we're we're doing this, man. Uh, so yeah, I think the two drop slot is a really well suited two drop slot to again set you up for those future turns, and that's really the goal of the deck. Uh, now three drops are where we get really interesting, in my opinion, and I am gonna disclaimer slightly here. <laughs> uh, we talked about this before sitting down. Some of these cards. Are cards that I'd like to test out and I think work well in the strategy. 
but that I don't necessarily know the exact right number for. So as you're testing this deck, you'll probably want to play around with these numbers, may even play with some new cards and things like that. But these are the cards that really stuck out in my mind as the really strong pieces uh, uh, for the deck. Um, now, the first one I'm going to talk about is Professional Facebreaker, which I think has my nomination for the coolest name in Magic history. Uh, I think that's so sick. Um, <laughs> it's a three mana, two, three. Uh, it does have Menace, so it's a little bit tricky to block. And whenever one or more creatures you control deal combat damage to a player, you create a treasure token. Now, in addition to that, you can sacrifice a treasure token, exile the top card of your deck, and you can play it this turn. What this does is, A, continue the setup process because you're gaining more treasure tokens ideally every turn. On top of that, uh, it does set you up in the later turns of the game to utilize that treasure token in a way that makes a lot of sense. If you do burn out towards that mid to late game, as in you have less cards in your hand, you want to find a way to play extra cards off the top. So we're starting to see the introduction of that sub theme into uh, the deck at this three drop slot. We continue that sub theme with things like Riveteer's Charm. Only a two of, in my opinion. Uh, I don't think you go too crazy with this for a couple reasons. A, the mana cost is difficult. Now in a treasure deck, that shouldn't be too difficult to do, but it is something you have to think about. Uh, and it does a lot of things, but I don't know that all of the things are great all of the time, obviously. And so I think, um, you know, the, the thing that works really well in this deck is it sets you up in the late game to be able to play extra cards off the top of your deck. You can do it at instant speed, so you can do it at the end of the opponent's turn, uh, and then utilize all of your mana on the following turn if you so choose. It does give you a, a, an out for the graveyard deck. So if you find yourself up against Reanimator or any kind of graveyard interaction, which there's actually quite a bit in this new set as well, um, that gives you the out to deal with it, uh, even if you don't necessarily plan for it every single matchup. Uh, it also is just a piece of removal. Uh, so this adds to the voltage surge that we saw in, in the one drop slot and gives you another option to deal with both creatures and planeswalkers. It is only a one for one, but it is something that is nice to have. And again, that flexibility is so crucial, in my opinion, because we've just got so many different things in the in the meta right now, in my opinion. Um, to move on to the last two cards, one we already know of, Fable of the Mirror Breaker. I've got this as a two of in here. Just a great way to continue again on that treasure theme, being able to to attack in and create a treasure token. Uh, it does allow you a little bit of card selection or looting, so to speak. So or rummaging, I guess, is the correct term if I'm uh, being politically correct here. <laughs> uh, it does allow you some rummaging and it does allow you on the flip side to be able to copy some things. So this just in in every capacity is a huge strength of the deck. This has been one of the best cards in Kamigawa, in my opinion, just for the setup that this card provides. Uh, and so I'm really excited for that. And then finally, we have two. And again, this this is where I think we could really get into some flexibility is with Omnixilis the Adversary. Uh, again, on my list for one of the top cards in the set, we'll talk about a combo with this as we get in uh, to the four drop slot. But all in all, I think this just does so much for the deck. Uh, you can create extra copies of Obnixilis and really get into it. Uh, and it, again, sets up a lot of scenarios where you're dealing with the opponent's hand, you're throwing out extra creatures, or if you get really lucky, you can start drawing some extra cards. And again, you've, you've set yourself up with some life gain in the early turns of the game. And so the life loss on that ultimate of losing seven is not as difficult to manage, we'll say, as it could be. Uh, in a in a straight kind of like Rakdos build where you don't really get that life gain. Um, yeah, I think I think that's all the three drops. Am I correct? Yes. We yes. did it. All yep. right. So how you feeling so far? We're we're through the majority of the the setup stuff at this mm -hmm. point. So wh where do you feel? Is there anything again that we're missing? Do you feel like it's so far kind of positioned well, or where where are your thoughts here? <laughs> No, I actually like it where it's at right now. Um, and the fact that you had added professional face breaker, I just discussed this card with uh, with my <laughs> community yesterday. I actually dig this card. I think this card's going to, man, 
I'll get more into gold spam when we get to my deck. But <laughs> um, I like it, man. I like it. Uh, Riveter's Charm, I think you were spot on. Fable of the Mirror Breaker in a deck like this with what you've got going on creature-wise, uh, yeah. non-legendary creatures, is just going to be absolutely unruly on the field. And Obnixilis, I mean, you're about to get to the juicy part of that, which yeah. I absolutely love. But uh, yeah, man. <laughs> no, I like it. You went all out on this. I, I got to say, my, my, mine's a little... We'll talk about it when we get That's there. Okay. I'm going to ramble. I, I really <laughs> tried to think through every little detail of this deck. And again, the numbers aren't perfect. So I do want to say that those things are going to have to be played with as we get into the format. Mm -hmm. But we haven't had the opportunity to play with the deck yet. So this is a new thing yeah. for me. But it really is interesting. And I want to talk about it in expanse, you know, the yes. whole thing overall. So I'm going to let you keep going on because okay. there's just... You, you've got so many tools in this box yeah. that uh, work so well well together. Um, this is actually a frightening deck list to go up against. <laughs> <laughs> well, we'll we'll keep going. But yeah, I would like to kind of, when we get through the individual cards, I, I would like to talk about the deck as a whole because there are some things that, you know, we'll, we'll see as a, a little sub-theme as we go through. But mm -hmm. uh, to move on to the four drop slot, um, I'm going to start with the least exciting card which is at Sushi the Blazing Sky, in my opinion. Um, it's funny to say that that's the least exciting card because I love at Sushi. <laughs> I think that card's ridiculous. Um, but here's the thing, and this is part of that sub-theme that I wanted to discuss that we can talk about as we get towards the end of the deck as well. So much of this deck is focused on just a powerful card that works extraordinarily well on its own, but also has the synergies that play well with the deck. This is a prime example of taking both of the main themes of the deck, i.e. treasure tokens and being able to play extra cards, and throwing them onto one card and then saying, okay, you have to deal with it, and if you do, I still get to do the thing that I want to do. Uh, and so 4-4 four, for four, 4, we know what Atsushi is, but if it dies, you get to either create three treasure tokens or exile the top two cards of your deck, and then you can play them until the end of your next turn. That's like insane for this deck. It does everything you want it to. Um, There's also just a flying threat. It has trample. It's going to be difficult to deal with. So to me, this was just a prime include. It's like you, you kind of just have to have it. Uh, now, another older card, but potentially one of the more exciting cards in the deck is Asika's Chariot. Uh, I'm going to credit Country Fried with uh, showing me or, or telling me how this works because I can't claim credit for this. The uh, Asika's Chariot works surprisingly well <laughs> uh, with Obnixilis, specifically the token that you can casualty out with Obnixilis because it is a non-legendary planeswalker and you can copy it with Asika's Chariot. So if that works out in a, some capacity, you can start copying those Obnixilis uh, uh, tokens and really start to go off. All of a sudden, you're setting yourself up to destroy the opponent's hand completely. <laughs> Uh, to create a ton of little devil tokens that even if they kill, they have to take life for. And then, I mean, basically it's just like a, a downhill slope at that point. So uh, it also just works well in general with things like Fable of the Mirror Breaker. That's a card that we know works great with it because we get that 2-2 two -two that when it attacks, you get a treasure token. We can certainly go that direction if we chose to. Um, but in general, it just is a great card for the deck. And then the last four drop, uh, is a really interesting one, and I'm really wanting to try this one. So I'll I'll lead off by saying I'm not sure that this works super well in the deck, but I think it does. Uh, it's one and all the Riveteer colors, black, red, green, for a 5-4 with Trample. When it deals combat damage to a player, oh, I should say, it's Zeratora's Envoy. I didn't say the name. <laughs> Just kind of went on. Anyway, <laughs> uh, it's a 5-4. When it deals combat damage to a player, look at the top card of your deck. You can play a land card from the top of your library or cast uh, the spell with mana value less than or equal to the damage dealt from the top of your library without paying its mana cost. That's just good on its own. Again, a little bit of a theme. We want to have cards that are good on their own. However, this works super well with the deck because if you don't, you still put that card in your hand. And so the idea is that you draw the card if you can't play it, and then off of all the treasure tokens that you're creating throughout the, the early turns of the game, you should be able to. Now, this also does have the Blitz cost for two and Jund, uh, which is also really handy. Um, but that's all we have for the four drop slot. We're kind of starting to curve out. Three is really the high point of the deck. So we're starting to kind of curve down into just some of the, the mid-rangey threats. Uh, and I 
there were a lot to choose from here. <laughs> but again, I'm curious, again, your thought on, in particular, the Envoy. Uh, do you think it works well in the deck? Oh, I like the Envoy, man. I like the Envoy a lot. And, um, I mean, just, I mean, like you were saying, the chance to tutor off the top or looking at the top of your library and then you can play a land card from there. And it, it is kind of tutoring off the top. It's thinning yeah. out your deck in a way. And uh, the blitz cost is not to be underestimated either. So it's, you know, um, I do wonder though, since they didn't put in the text here with the blitz cost, um, it doesn't have like the whole, um, what is it where you uh, have to sacrifice the creature at the end of turn and then you get to draw a card. I mean, yeah. that is part of Blitz, right? Yes, yes. Okay, so, yeah, I mean, you get more card draw off yeah. of it if you go with your Blitz ability. Plus, it's a 5-4 for 4. Yeah, that's, like, I super mean, good. And with the treasure tokens, it's pretty easy to get that mana cost where, again, you're having to get all three colors incorporated into that. Yeah, this deck thins out really well. And the other thing that I like about it, well, and I mean, I keep wanting to go on a wider scope. I'll still hold my tongue on it. But right. uh, no, I like I like the Envoy a lot. I think it fits really well in this deck design. Um, I get it. He's uh, he's a warrior and stuff. But I mean, you know, he looks like he looks like a demon. Yeah, to me. <laughs> he definitely looks like a demon dragon type person. He looks pretty sick to me. <laughs> and so it kind of themes out in here too. But uh, no, I like it. Obnixilis, um, a sushi. Uh, you explained at sushi perfectly. Um, it's it's when it dies, mm -hmm. all aspects of that card fit into this really well. Man, it's a really well designed deck. You're blowing my mind right now. Heck yeah. In the best of ways. That's in the best the, of ways. That's the goal. This is just for you. Everybody listening, this isn't for you. You can <laughs> you can tune out. No. Um there's also some uh things that I would like to talk about when we get into the the higher up stuff that works really well with that sushi and stuff like that too. So we'll we'll talk about mm -hmm. that. But uh I'll go ahead and kind of jump into that and I'm gonna group the five and six drops slot we top out at six um we do have some really interesting cards though here so first and foremost we got four gold span dragon wow who saw that coming all right <laughs> moving on we have uh a couple new cards uh to, to help round us out uh sidebar obviously gold span dragon is just ridiculous for this deck you should always play it in a treasure deck period until it gets banned Thanks to Country Fried and his deck list, that might be a possibility. <laughs> anyway, uh, we... <laughs> Sorry, dude, I had to throw you under the bus. That's um, all right, I was going to talk about it. <laughs> good. Uh, we have uh, another new Praetor, uh, which I'll be honest, I have kind of taken my sweet time to look through all of the, the cards in this set. I completely forgot that this card was in the set and then i looked at it i was like oh well that's just really good so i'm gonna do that a uh, couple it's things so good oh so yeah this, good. this card's ridiculous so erebras heretic praetor uh five mana three and two red for a four four it does have haste so it's able to get down immediately and start attacking in uh which again haste is pretty common in this set we've got it um with the gold span dragon as well and it's just really good but uh, at the beginning of your upkeep, exile the top card of your deck. You can play it this turn. Uh, and so, again, the sub-theme of giving you extra cards to play with. This is really important, in my opinion, because you do want to start doubling up once you get to this point in the game. Uh, and then finally, at the beginning of each opponent's upkeep, the next time they would draw a card this turn, instead they exile the top card of their deck, they may play it this turn. This is like as close as this deck gets to a prison element um which is so sick in my opinion it basically says like hey you have to play this card this turn or it's just gone uh and it is in exile which means they don't get it back so any graveyard deck it really helps to shut down any kind of uh like instant speed decks so control decks in particular not gonna have a great time against this and so uh a really really interesting card in my opinion i don't know that it's at its best here necessarily but i do think it's a very very synergistic card with the deck in particular giving you that extra card for the turn if you don't play it it's fine but importantly it gives you that option and we have a lot of great options in this deck and so for me this is just a really powerful uh ability and then finally the last card uh which is i think just a freaking cool card. We got Zeratora, the Incinerator. 
three and jund for a six six flyer at the beginning of your end step you may sacrifice another creature when you do it deals damage equal to that creature's power to any target and you create three treasure tokens so that at sushi that we want to die uh we 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 make it die and then we get more <laughs> things you can get six treasure tokens off of that <laughs> it's like it, it to me is a really good way a to finish the game um in a situation where you've only got a few more points of life that you need to deal this shuts that down and just finishes the game for you without necessarily having to get down for that attack you can get the attack in play this second main phase and then at the beginning of your end step sacrifice a creature and just get rid of it um importantly uh this works super well or no no no. excuse me yes that was all i was gonna say about it i think it's just really good um it works great for the deck and that's that's basically the deck um i can talk really quick also about the lands um nothing too crazy here but we of course have four of the triumphs in here because why wouldn't you uh i did incorporate a couple of field of ruin because obviously we are going to have quite a number of uh man lands still in the format this also deals with opposing triumphs pretty well. So with the really well pushed uh, mana base, it could actually be really important to start shutting down some of the triumph lands on the opposing side of the field. I did incorporate one of each basic land, so we're never going to be short on what we can pull from that field of ruin. And if we do need a particular color, that gives us that option. Uh, we do have Basiju who endures, so that's going to give us a little bit of removal opportunity if we so choose. Uh, and then Den of the Bugbear and Lair of the Hydra for two man land threats that don't really get hit with sweepers and things like that. So uh, that's the deck. I did it. We made it. There you go. Nice. Do you want to do an overall? Um. Yeah. I'll. So in summary, I mean, your scope. Yeah. So the in summary of this deck, um, I I have this in as like a mid range style deck because I do think that's just what it is. Um, I actually had it as control because the initial list was not treasure focused at all and it was much more control. But um, this is very much a mid range style deck that's really looking to capitalize on those two themes that I mentioned at the beginning. Really pumping out tons and tons of treasure and then giving you an outlet to actually utilize them, uh, which I think is a bit of a downfall with the deck now. Uh, in terms of it just doesn't always have a lot to do um importantly a lot of the cards well don't know stop we'll talk about that um we'll <laughs> it's talk got about a ton that. to do <laughs> yes yeah. but i i've had the experience of burning it out pretty quickly as well mm. like it it does have a lot to do and it does dig pretty deep but occasionally and and again this is part of the theme of this deck all of the cards impact in a big way uh right. aside from maybe voltage surge and like even even riveteer's charm is really good so like it's really hard to find a card that isn't gonna do anything uh mm -hmm. with this deck and that's again the crucial piece to this is that even if you do burn out you've still got at least one or two threats that you just get to drop down immediately and really start to continue or, or hopefully continue the takeover um and so for me yeah that was really the focus of the deck i think it came together pretty well Again, this is being said without testing it. Uh, and so I really don't know yet. Uh, but maybe, I mean, by the time this video or this podcast episode comes out, I will have tested it. Uh, but at the moment, I haven't. So here's to hoping. <laughs> All right. I've got so much to say. My partner, Crime, you've built a beautiful deck here. Thank you. I love it. Um, there are a couple of things that I would change, but not the deck style itself yeah. and the interactions of this. I don't know if everybody's even caught on yet. Look, your mirror breaker, when you flip it, makes a token of a creature that you have to uh, sack yep. at the end of your turn. So make a copy of your Goldspan Dragon and copy that token with the Zika's Chariot. Yep. Or copy your Obnixilis, uh non-legendary. You know, I mean, well, and... if you want to get rid of at, at sushi, copy your at sushi with the uh, with with the uh, mirror breaker, and just let the token copy come in, and then just sack it, and then you got three treasure tokens. Well, and importantly, you can sack it to the Zeratora versus the actual sack trigger on the token itself. So you can stack the triggers in a way that you actually get another benefit from sacrificing the token. And right. that work again, that's that little synergistic piece of it. There's a lot of that in the deck for sure. 
Yeah, so it could go absolutely ballistic. I mean, and then if you did like the Atsushi with the Mirror Breaker and you copied it and you sacked one of them because of the legendary rule, and then you go to attack and you do Azika's Chariot and you copy that copy and one of them sacks because of the legendary rule, <laughs> and you just made six <laughs> treasure tokens off of it or you're looking at the top of your deck, it, it gets absolutely ballistic. There's so much synergy going on with this. And then, like we said, the Azika's Chariot to the Obnixilis non-legendary um you've got like you said a prison style creature in here with urbrask that can actually match up really well against counter control decks because i mean no control player likes losing their counter spells off the top of their deck and if they can't cast them if they got no reason to cast them then they're just trash and they're going yeah. to exile so they're not even going to be able to recover them from the graveyard uh yeah i mean you got a lot going on here uh the only only suggestions i would have is i would definitely leave in lair of the hydra yeah i would maybe take out den of the bugbear because okay. lair of the hydra you can pump it up as much as you want the yeah. den of the bugbear i would actually probably change that over to a ball of Ged recovery because if you actually needed to grab one crucial crucial piece back yeah. from your graveyard and put it back in hand um, but that's just because I like graveyard recovery. It doesn't mean you have to. Well, and then I would probably try and find. I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, no, no. I was just gonna say to that point. So, a yes, I agree. I think having a little bit of graveyard recursion is never a bad thing. So I I appreciate the suggestion there. I will say there was a reason for the den of the bugbear in the sense that you can sack the one one post combat or towards the end step with zero Torah and get three treasure tokens off of sacking a one one. Uh, and so, again, that synergistic piece was kind of playing into it because you can okay. recreate that 1-1 one, one every turn if you attack. And yeah. it's a free way to get three treasure tokens, essentially. No, then I like it. And that makes sense. I, I overlooked that. So, I mean, I would probably try and find a way to at least yeah. get one Bala get in here just because there are crucial piece, pieces that you could pull back that could just out, outright win the game depending on where you're at in the game yeah um with Zeatora only being a two of um i would find myself trying to cram maybe three storm the festivals in here because that's the only one you're not going to hit yep and i think that's fair storm the festival is just oh man with all the treasure tokens you got yeah. uh popping off in this thing you would be casting it on its six costs and it's 10 costs the next turn yeah i think um you know, that was a piece that I actually looked at, and part of me was thinking if I got rid of or trimmed down in the two-drop slot between the Gallagreeters and the Prosperous Innkeepers, that mm -hmm. might be a good top-end play. Or if I trimmed down to, like... Ah, it's hard to trim out cards in this deck, but, like, the Envoy oh, yeah. or something along those lines. You know, the, the Storm of the Festival is such a great top-end play, and it's an easy two-for-one, um, and really a four-for-two when you look at the, the math as a whole, which I know equates to the same but you get the idea um it's it's such a powerful play and for a treasure deck it's not that difficult to play um the trick that i was i ran into quite a bit was how do i slot it in and is it is it the best thing for the deck and i think um there's certainly a good strong argument to be made that it's probably really important for the deck and so uh i i don't know what i'd take out for it that's my only trick um but it is something to consider for sure. It might be that we trim down to like single legends in particular areas. Um, but I don't love that. Uh, I will say the deck draws so many extra cards. At least that's the goal of the deck. Um, mm -hmm. And I, when I say draw, I mean throws them into exile and you can play them that turn. Uh, because it has so much of that, I feel like it's not crazy difficult to find a lot of the two ofs that you've got in the list. Um, just because you've got a lot of those actions going on. Um, you've also got Fable of the Mirror Breaker, which can help you rummage, as you as, as we mentioned. And so you've got opportunities there to kind of dig through and hopefully find what you need. Um, but all that to say, I think Storm of the Festival would be amazing. <laughs> yeah, and nothing says you got to stick three or four of them in there. You can just go with two sure. at the top. Yeah, yeah. Of course. So you could take out maybe like one of the two drops, maybe, I yep. don't know, man. I'm loving the deck. I don't know that I want to touch anything. Um, <laughs> maybe a voltage surge, but voltage surge, I think, is going to be important in this deck because I think aggro yeah. is going to be crazy right off the bat, especially with the triomes going. I think so, too. Um, maybe a professional face breaker. I mean, just maybe 
drop your odds a little bit on yeah. one of the four ofs and just throw in two because i mean nothing says you're going to hit the two Hell, even if you had four of them nothing says you're going to hit one of the yeah, four exactly uh shuffler is fine but <laughs> if you do the value in it with the treasure you're taking on uh with this deck that you're building up i think is just astronomical yeah <laughs> i love it dude it's a fun i love one. it man it's a fun and i'm one. not even a great i'm I, i'm not a big fan of aggro but <laughs> i'm i'm definitely taking this one for a spin tomorrow it's gonna be a fun one for sure I'm for anybody that doesn't know we're recording spin. this on wednesday and so the actual decks are gonna be available basically tomorrow um by the time this goes out they'll have been up all weekend but i'm so stoked about this one i think it's gonna be great oh yeah man well done dude well thank you done. man such a great deck list dude. thank you dude look at that it just looks like a it looks like a pile of fun that was the goal <laughs> man it was man. uh I, again deck building is not i love deck building let me let me be clear but i find that in practice i don't always have the best decks and so my assumption is that this will have some major fatal flaw when i go to run it um however i really do like the look of it just off the face of it and i think it's going to be a really interesting one for sure so We'll see how it how it shakes out. I think it's got some legs. We'll see. Yeah, no, it it just looks like you're pounding threat after threat after threat, Basically. and <laughs> and I, like I said, maybe a ball of good, maybe a couple storm the festivals. That's about the only thing that I may even consider. And I yeah. don't until I run it. I don't even know if I consider them. Um, the ball of good though is probably the first one I'd look at personally, yeah. just because uh, you're running twenty four lands, which is fine, especially with what your uh, CMC average is. Yep um so that was well done uh <laughs> the ball again also, just increasing it a little bit if you had to use it as a land but yeah, just with that yeah. graveyard recursion just kind of makes me personally feel more comfortable yep. um just because i like you know i like i like trying to fit in ways to uh, bring my graveyard into the game as well it's it's almost like having a learn card and yeah, getting the sure. extra seven for your sideboard and uh people aren't always expecting it but uh yeah man no super impressed i love this one dude thank you man thank you thank you well let's yeah. uh let's let's jump out of rivet here then uh let's uh let's talk about your deck because your deck is a new adaptation, essentially, of a deck that already exists, but has a, having a lot more pieces from the new set that are going to be incorporated into this. I'm really curious to see your thoughts here. So go for it, man. Let's let's talk through what you got. All right, man. So I'll do the same thing. I'll go through the CMC list. Um, if you guys want to pull it up and follow along, you can do that. We've got the links down below and stuff. But uh, yeah, dude, old red, white, and blue, man. Uh, I want to I want to give this Just Guy list, uh, the Just Guy combo list, to be exact, a new new shot. Um, I think it actually has a chance to be absolutely dumb with the new additions <laughs> from this new set. So. Uh, the old combo set, just real quick, um, if people have played it, you're you're looking for unexpected windfall, you're trying to get your card advantage, your galvanic iterations, then you want to hit show of confidence on gold span dragon, create a million tokens, give it a million plus one plus ones, and then throw out with like your Kozul's Fury or something, and you smack them for 15 with the gold span, and then you finish off with Kozul's Fury, or I mean, there's chances you could make a 2020 gold span dragon. It just goes absolutely ballistic. It's a combo that you know, you're looking to try and hit by turn five or six. And the biggest piece of the puzzle that was missing was the percentage of being able to hit unexpected windfall. And you've got stuff like expressive iteration and all that in the old deck. So with that, <laughs> I hope that was a long <laughs> enough explanation. That was perfect. With that, with that all, all this, all, all Streets of New Capenna did was up the odds. Yeah. Because everybody knows the one card that's going to come up in this list, uh, hopefully. And if not, we're going to explain it. But first up, we've got three spike field hazards. Can be used as a land. And this deck list runs really low on lands. So you're, you've got alternate cards in here to utilize as lands. you got your dual abilities. But spike field hazard, you're looking at like generous visitors and luminarch aspirants. Stuff that's going to take off early game. It's going to pressure you. And you need to try and be getting to turn five or six. So it can be re uh, utilized as removal. And of course, you get the exile effect off of it if the creature died. And then next up, we got uh, slip out the back, which is new from Streets of Capena, uh, Streets of New Capena, which is my favorite out of the blue. 
and it is a one blue instant and you put a plus one plus one counter on target creature and it phases out so if you target your gold span it creates a treasure and now instead of using um fading hope and bouncing it back to your hand and having to reutilize your casting cost on gold span to get it back into the game now you just phase it out and you make it a five five and you create a treasure it does not seem fair <laughs> so <laughs> And then we've got uh, one boon of safety because I want to try it. I think the card's really good, but I don't know how much uh, exile effects are going to be running around when the meta kicks off. I don't think there's going to be that many. So this may actually take slip out the back down to three and maybe put boon of safety to two eventually. But it is a one white. It was also my selection from last week's <laughs> podcast. It is an instant. There were reasons why I selected these, man. Yeah, yeah. No, I get you. <laughs> so, it is an instant. You put a shield counter on target creature. So you target gold span. You put a shield counter on it. Can't be destroyed. Can't be damaged. And if it is, you just remove the shield counter and it's fine. And you get to scry one. So it's kind of like a uh, fading hope. You're just not removing it from all threats because you're not removing it from exile abilities. So I think there's a utilization for this too. I mean, usually if you play enough, you can guess what the meta is. You can kind of guess what your opponent's doing with their decks. Um, so depending on where the meta goes, we can figure out whether we're putting more of these in or if we're just keeping it where it's at because that scryability can become really, really uh, important throughout the game, especially with this deck list. So that are my one, that's my one drop selection. What do you think so far? So I would agree with everything you said. Um, I think the important question that I was looking at when I initially looked at the deck list and you hadn't kind of talked me through it a little bit is the boon of safety versus slip out the back. Um, mm -hmm. I do think that in terms of synergy with just the deck, the boon safety or boon of safety, that scry ability really is crucial because um, obviously your goal is to dig down towards a gold span dragon or a combo piece or, you know, we'll talk about some of the other cards as we go through, but there are mm -hmm. certainly cards that you are looking to get. Uh, and scry seems very overvalued in a deck like this. And so I do see that as purely better for the deck as a whole. Now, slip out the back is just a pure upgrade to fading hope, in my opinion. I will say oh, yeah. uh, it's a little bit tr of a double-edged sword because I think fading hope is really good on a more aggressive plane. So what I mean by that is bouncing the opponent's creature in a situation where you find the need to uh, and then having them invest mana again and replaying it is certainly something that is worthwhile considering. And so I was uh, the first thing that kind of came to mind is, do you still run Fading Hope in some capacity just for that opportunity and for that flexibility? Um, but again, I think that we're what we're showing off here is the thing that we talked about at the very beginning of the episode, which is that decks are going to have, you know, a core value or a core idea. And then how you get there is going to be so determined by the player playing the deck and what they see in their meta experience. And so you're going to see some people, I think, run any number of different combinations of these kinds of cards that we're talking about. And so, <clears throat> excuse me, um, I do think it's going to be really interesting to kind of see where these land or if it becomes like, OK, no, you run exactly this number of whatever mm -hmm. card. I don't think we'll get there. I think it'll it will always flex a little bit. Um, but all of them great options, and it is really nice to see some some just like basic commons and uncommons finding their home in in a brand uh, new format that we're going to be experiencing here very shortly. Or I guess by the time this goes out, we will be experiencing it. So. Yeah. No, you hit it. And that's kind of what I was doing is maybe this is a list for somebody that's already got the original built yeah. and doesn't have a whole lot of wild cards going on but I think it's still going to be ultra competitive. And there are a bunch of flexor cards in here, which I'll definitely cover over at the end because yeah. I, I do, I do agree with you. I think fading hope could be in there and I, and I've got specific cards that I would flex out for it. And okay. I think, uh, you know, other cards like Cinderclasm could probably still be in here and I've got a flex spot for that as well, yeah. but I'll definitely cover that here at the end. Okay. But yeah, good point. Good point on all. So we'll go to the two CMC, uh, portion we've got sajiri shelter just for protection of gold span and uh leer if we absolutely need it like if they're trying to hit them with vanishing versus or something you just you know you select white or black mm -hmm. and then uh we got show of confidence which in the overall picture is part of the combo and it is uh 
when you cast a spell, you copy it for each other instant and sorcery spell that you've cast this turn. And you may choose a new target for that for those copies. And then you put a plus one plus one counter on the target creature, and then it gains vigilance until the end of turn. And that's kind of the one that you're trying to, t you know, you're trying to go into your loop and do a whole bunch of draws and a whole bunch of things with your instants and sorceries and utilize your gold span dragon because that's what you're going to be targeting with show of confidence. Like I said, there's there's been times where I got stuck in the perfect loop and I've taken a gold span dragon up to 24 24 yeah. and it drops a ton of tokens a ton. <laughs> <laughs> so it gets out of control um expressive iteration i think everybody knows what it is you look at the top three cards of your library you put one in hand one back at the bottom of your library and then you put one exiled and you got to play that exiled card that turn or it does go to exile and you're usually exile on your land turn or your land for that turn so I think everybody knows what that one is. And then Galvanic Iteration is just two CMC. It's blue-red. It's an instant. And then when you cast your next spell or sorcery spell this turn, you can copy that spell, and you may choose a new target for the copy. And it's got a flashback cost of three. However, if you got Leer on the board, you can recast it from the graveyard for two instead of its three cost. And if you hit Show of Confidence with Galvanic Iteration on your goal span and you've got like 15 spells already kicked off, well, now you got 30 targets on goal span. <laughs> so it just gets absolutely nuts. And then here is a finisher that I run that the normal deck list does not. So if you guys are wanting the actual metagame deck list, you'd probably have to research that a little bit won't be hard to find on a either hub but i run crackle with power and i've finished games out with this and it's absolutely humiliating for my opponent i'm pretty sure <laughs> but it's brilliant for me because <laughs> it looks like the death star coming down <laughs> you cast crackle with power for three x costs you, you got x x x so if you're selecting one you got to pay one 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 and then you cast with uh, two red as well and it's a sorcery cost so Crackle with Power deals five times X, that amount of damage to each two up to X targets. So if you cast it for three, you're dealing 15 points of damage to target player. And I don't know, maybe, you know, two other creatures or a creature <laughs> or a planeswalker. And I mean, by the time you're casting this, the game's over. Yeah. I usually just select the uh, player. I don't go into humiliation play or look at what I can do. I just select the player and just leave it at one selection, even if I cast it for four. <laughs> so it's well, now like, you're just playing it wrong. I don't yeah, know. Yeah, well, <laughs> you I gotta know, humiliate people. <laughs> no, I can't. Man. It's you know, it's the Stewie from Mad TV. Look yes. at what I can do. <laughs> so, yes, exactly. <laughs> no, but Crackle with Power is a finisher, kind of like. Uh, Kuzul's Fury when we get to it I'll explain that one as well but uh, I got two negates in here just in case if we're running up against any type of counter deck um, man, counter, counter decks may be not as prevalent as aggro when meta starts with Streets of New Capenna but counter decks can be super powerful with the additions that New Capenna gave especially with cards like Void Ren and stuff like that so I think Negate's going to be a player in here however this will be one of the flex positions for possible Fading Hopes because I do I do agree Fading Hope can almost act like a Negate yeah. except on a creature and you do have a great point with that there is times where you want to do creature removal on your opponent's side instead of using it just for your gold span yep. so there's two Negates in here right now but that's a flexor position we got one Juari's Disruption hitting it early game is beautiful. I mean, it's it's like hearing a symphony hitting it late game is just kind of like a thud. Yeah. So, but it's still utilized as a land more often than not. But like I said, if you hit it early game and you can and you've got an opponent that just loves to tap out on their turn, you're gonna hit them. I mean, especially mono black and their turn five loss. They love it. They yeah. love it. They love it. And Juari's Disruption somehow it always ends up in my hand and that ends up being my counter yeah uh next up in the two slot and this is the last of the two cmc cost is a braid it's an instant i'm utilizing it as a removal card it deals three damage to a target creature like i said i'm only looking for creatures really through turns three and four by five and six we're looking to have that combo kicking off and usually on turns three and four a three damage usually does it plus it can also destroy target artifacts so if you're looking at reckoner bank busters or celestis and stuff like that however or even you know azika's chariot yeah however after looking at your deck my man 
<laughs> <laughs> you're making me rethink bolted surge are you <laughs> yeah you're making me think about it man you're definitely yeah. making me think about because this is another flexor position and the flexor that i had in thinking that i was thinking of in this that i used to run a lot of was cinder clasm yeah for sure um but voltage surge i mean we usually get enough treasures and four damage is usually enough to take out whatever we need to yeah. uh it's definitely a good card but cinder is still another possibility and that would be the a braid would be the flexor for cinder yeah i think um you know looking through your two drops here i think i certainly agree with your your evaluation in terms of the flex positions because a braid is actually a personal favorite of mine obviously it came out i think in like amonkhet or something like that and during during its time, I felt like it was always just a really good option to have because three damage is generally enough to get you out of a, a random, you know, one for one position. Uh, and the flexibility to hit an artifact is obviously really important. I think as we've seen the meta shift in particular with Kamigawa coming in, um, we're seeing a a lot more enchantments. Mm -hmm. uh, which is certainly difficult to deal with, but we are still seeing a lot of, as you said, Rankin or uh, Reckon or Bankbusters and the vehicles decks and things like that. Uh, and so it is really important, I think, to have that ability. But that is a hundred percent a medical. It's a hundred percent based on what you think you'll be up against, not what is actually in the or actually a possible option, because you're gonna have to kind of focus, I think, more on one versus the other the majority of the time. I would also suggest uh, Voltage Surge works really well against Planeswalkers, uh, which are very prevalent in the meta. Now, importantly, you, with Crackle with Power and with some other cards that I'm sure you'll talk about later, have ways to kind of not deal with Planeswalkers necessarily, but just make them negligible. <laughs> just mm -hmm. make them kind of null and void because they don't, aside from the Wanderer, they don't work at like instant speed. And so you're kind of able to get around it and not really care. Um, most importantly, I think you want to keep the board presence clear in the creature side of things so you can get that big attack in and then use your Kazul's Fury to finish the, the job. Uh, and so I would say, obviously, creatures does need to be the focus. Negate, like you said, versus Roy Disruption versus other kinds of interaction, like certainly opportunities to look at there. I would also say, and this is a sidebar uh, and not directed at you because you mentioned how to play Expressive Iteration, Mm -hmm. guys holy shit i am so sorry that i'm like being really picky about this stop wasting your expressive iterations don't play a land and then play expressive iteration i don't know how many times i see that now look i played the card for the first time whenever it came out and i did it the first time and i'm like oh this is a terrible play i'm never doing this again it's still a terrible play. Don't do it. I don't understand why people do that. Yeah, no, it happens. And expressive iteration, I mean, there are times where you're casting it to look for that final piece of the puzzle. Sure. And, and you can up it like that. But yeah, look, uh, expressive iteration, even for me, man, if you've ever seen me play this card on live stream, you get a blast out of it because yeah. I will out loud. I'll be like one to hand, one to library one exiled yeah <laughs> and i mean 100%. i gotta i gotta say it out loud every time it does yeah i have to do that too but expressive iteration is a really powerful card it's one that mm -hmm. i've seen like reed duke who's one of my favorite favorite professional players he's played this card in like legacy before and i'm like when was the last time we saw a lot of new cards like that hit legacy and i'm like okay the power yeah. level's there it's two mana you see three cards it replaces itself it even gives you an extra play so it's a little clunky sure but it's really good in standard um and so it's a card that you should you should play if you're playing the colors and you should learn how to play it appropriately <laughs> that's all i'm yeah. saying yeah no but yeah look i mean you touched on you touched on a, a magic genius right there man um <laughs> i don't know that he'd ever hear this podcast but yeah reed duke's the he's the bar oh, <laughs> he man. is the bar um but yeah if he could make it work anywhere if anybody could make it work anywhere he would but yeah. um yeah it's just it's one that shuts down my brain when i play it though even and i play it a lot but i yeah. mean i literally do have to vocalize it every time yeah. one in hand one in library one in exile and chat just loves it man yeah. they're like here we go one yep. in hand one in library <laughs> one in exile <laughs> and it's every time dude i can't stop so but, yeah if that's what you got to do though it's important 
So yeah, good. absolutely. Well, and with the flexor spot on a braid too, I, we, we had mentioned a couple things. One that I did want to touch on that's not in here that you could utilize as well is Prismari Command. Ah, yeah. So that's a real important one to look at too. You can create the treasury, you can draw two cards, dis two, discard two cards, or do two damage to something. So Prismari Commands definitely, but a braid and negate are my flexor cards in this. And that are that is the four flexor cards we've got. So um, really quick. Maybe one of the slip out the backs. Yeah. Yeah, no, definitely. Um, you bring up a really good point. Normally we do see some number of Prismari Commands in this style deck, but, mm -hmm. and this is, I'm asking you because I know you play this deck or you have played this deck probably more mm -hmm. than I have. Where do you land on the the flexibility of Prismari Command versus the cost of Prismari Command? Because I think something that you have to consider in a deck like this is the overall efficiency of any given card where you are trying to get as low on the curve as possible with basically everything that you can do. Um, one mana doesn't seem like a ton, I know, because you are adding one mana to play a Prismari Command. But A, I mean, you have to have both blue and red, plus you have an extra one. Is that, is that, I mean, where's that consideration? Where do you land on, is Prismari Command a better option because it brings more flexibility to the table? Because it does give you that draw ability or the looting ability. It does give you the, the artifact destruction, the, the burn, like kind of does everything you want, but it is more expensive. Mm. Yeah, so the actual metagame deck, the most people see that like went into the tournaments and stuff like that only runs one copy of it. Okay. Um, look, I'm just, I'm not a huge fan of it. You, you basically hit it right there with the cost. Yeah. Um, and I've, I've got other things I'm usually wanting to do. Uh, I think we got a card coming up that actually even diminished it even further. Yeah. Because you're really wanting to hit that treasure token. And you're really either wanting to blow something up, a small creature or an artifact, which is fine, you know. But you usually want to do that draw to discard to as well. Yeah. And um, so you're you're looking at treasure token, draw card, uh, draw to discard to. And I've seen people misplay that card too, where they've had an empty hands and they draw two and they just discarded the two that they draw. Yeah. I've so seen that. you know. <laughs> um, but like I said, it's a one of. Yeah. And I think it got diminished. Okay. That's coming up. Yeah, That's we'll talk about up. that then. You go right <laughs> yeah. ahead. And no I would suggest, um, because your three drop slot is a card, mm -hmm. we can mention it real quick and there's not a whole lot else to say about it. So yeah, I know no, you can go yeah. for it. It's the big guy with another guy. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> He's got the what is it, the corn or core what what are what, what is it? it Hold priest. On. It's the priest from is the band party. Oh, uh yeah. Um crap, what's his name? I can't think of it either. Know. Let's not get stuck on Let's it. Not. If you think of it, just blurt in. All right, I got you. <laughs> so we got Kazul's Fury. It can be utilized as a mountain, but it is a three uh, CMC. It's two colorless, one red. It's an instant, and as an additional uh, cost to cast this spell, sacrifice a creature, and Kazul's Fury deals damage equal to the sacrifice creature's power to any target. Like I said, it's a finisher. You're going to do the show of confidence. You're going to pump up your goal span. It's going to go in like the Red Hulk. It's going to smash your opponent in the face, and then you're going to cast Kazul's Fury on that goal span, and then you're just going to fling it right back to your opponent's face, and you're just going to kill him with it. However, I've seen people misuse this card too. Make sure you target your opponent, yes. and then you select the creature yes. you want to sacrifice. And if you can attack with the creature first, <laughs> yes, I see that yes. a lot. Yeah, that's yeah. like a really easy misplay to make. I know I'm guilty of it, but I'm just saying. Oh, I've seen open boards where people don't. They're just like, oh, I'm going to burn you out. Like, oh, I'm going like, to sack. What if they counter? <laughs> like, <laughs> like, why didn't you get the extra two points of damage in before yeah. the sack? I mean, okay, whatever. Yeah. I mean, that's your mistake. That's my win. But, <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> but no, definitely don't uh, select your goal span and then throw your goal span at your goal span. It doesn't work that way. So <laughs> just be careful with that. Yeah. And then next up, we've got Unexpected Windfall, which I dropped from four to three. Unexpected Windfall is a four cost, two colorless, uh, two red instant as an additional cost to uh, cast this spell, discard a card. Look, people, don't be worried about the card you're discarding unless it's a Leer or Goldspan. Yeah. Because everything else in this deck can be brought back with Leer. <laughs> if it stays in your graveyard. So the only time you really got to be cognizant about this is with uh, Farewell and Go Blank. Stuff like that. Or if they've River got Tears Charm. Tyrants. And River Tears Charm now. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> 
But uh, or if they got a hive of the eye tyrant, and even if they got a hive of the eye tyrant, they got to be smart enough about the meta to be picking apart the correct cards. Yeah. So don't be too worried about what you're discarding with this. Um, and then of course you do that. You draw two cards. You create two treasure tokens. And if you hit this with a galvanic iteration, you only discard one card and you draw four cards and create four treasure tokens. <laughs> So don't mistake that with uh, Cathartic Pyre. Cathartic Pyre, you've got to discard two cards, draw two cards, discard two cards, draw two cards. Um, Galvanic Iteration will make you do that both times. I don't know why this one only makes you do one, and then Cathartic Pyre has to do it twice, but that's just the way it works. And then Big Score is the new one from uh, Streets of New Capanna. It is the big brother to Unexpected Wimpall or Big Sister, however you want to however you want to say it. <laughs> Um, it is three colorless and one red instead of two colorless, two red. So it's easier to cast off of this one. And it's the same card as an additional ca uh, cost to cast a spell. You discard a card, you draw two cards, you create two treasure tokens. I mean, seriously, the biggest part of this puzzle and the, and the biggest reason this didn't always go off correctly was not being able to find unexpected windfall fast enough. Yep. And now you just gave me four more. And they're, better <laughs> and they're better and they're better so i honestly think before i head into arena with this deck list i will probably drop leer down from three to two and i would probably put the other unexpected windfall back in here okay because then it's just going to be easier to hit and leer is not that hard to find especially yeah. in this deck list guys um and then if you get leer on when you got gold span with a million treasures on the battlefield uh, it's just look if you get to five or six with this deck list in general it's just game over but those are the three and four slots what do you think about big score it's just good uh, i don't have anything <laughs> to add other than it's just better so yes do it all right so <laughs> we'll go ahead and move on i'll just uh i'll finish out my creatures yeah, finish here it out. so the creatures are the three gold span dragons and the three leer so gold span dragons five costs three colorless two res four four it's got flying it's got haste who doesn't love this thing who does probably people who don't play it but <laughs> uh it attacks or becomes a target of a spell you create a treasure token and now your treasure tokens aren't creating one mana per treasure token they're creating two mana of chosen color for for treasure tokens so you're doubling and then leer gets on the battlefield one thing to remember spells can't be countered that's not your spells that's both sides of the board yep. spells cannot be countered when leer's there so that's why we've got the slip out the back and the boon of safety and we may have to put fading hope back in and the flexor with the uh, negates take them out and maybe put in maybe take out a slip out the back put in two boon of safety and then put in another couple fading hopes because it just helps protect and these two creatures are crucial you cannot win the game without them so you absolutely have to protect them more yep. than you have to more than you have to uh, protect anything else on the board so Lear hits the board and then each instant and sorcery card in your graveyard now has flashback and the flashback cost is equal to that card's mana cost so now you can cast your cards now when you do cast them though they go away so you can't reutilize them again but uh again galvanics flashback cost if you got Lear on the board and you cast it for three and i see that i'll laugh because yeah. you can actually cast it for two. And I've seen people do it wrong. And it just wastes a man. And they're still usually in good enough position to win. But, uh, yeah, just pay attention to what you're doing with this deck. Because it's got steps. It's got triggers. You can get max value out of it. And you can win the game by turn five or six if you do it correctly. And you get the right cards in place. You just got to know what you're playing and what you're playing against. And, yeah. um, you know, sometimes you got to sacrifice a card and play one out so it gets countered. So you can really do what you wanted to do that turn. And that's all you really got to watch. So that's the creature package for this. Anything to add on that? No. So, well, one thing I will say, um, mm -hmm. as you mentioned, these are cards you have to have in the deck for obvious reasons. So obviously you're going to have to not flex these slots too much. They need to be there. Right. Uh, this deck does dig quite well. Uh, and so there isn't a, a something to consider for the number of each one. What I will say, though, is uh, with that Leer, uh, the Leer passive that says nothing can be countered, um, I've certainly fallen victim to that. What I have found, and this isn't necessarily the right move, <laughs> I will just say, is that in in comparison to uh, with Negate and Jwari Disruption, Jwari Disruption has other utility. Um, while it's certainly less flexible in terms of what it always can hit, 
because it, it it's basically for spike and so they can pay out of it you are trying to win so early in the game that a lot of times you are hitting something on curve with the Jawari disruption and what that means is they don't necessarily have mana to, to outpace it or to get up around it so um i have actually found between those two cards leer and Jawari disruption um i tend to to really enjoy having a couple extra Jawari disruptions versus the negate mm -hmm. now not always because negate is purely better at dealing with stuff but having the ability to play it as a land gives it utility outside of just countering and after you play the leer it's completely useless unless you can play it for the landslide so just something to think about i'm not saying that's the right call by any means but again as we go back and look at that two drop slot that might be something to consider if you do want some early game interaction that also has utility and some capacity in the late game it's just a land it's not it's a tapped land at that so it's not hugely beneficial but it is better than just being a complete dead card so just some things to think about there as we uh, finish this deck out. But otherwise, I mean, you have to have those creatures, so you have to run them. Yeah, yeah, no, and you make a good point. And what what may surprise you though is the two negates that I put in are two Juarez disruptions I took out. Really? Yeah, I didn't know yeah. that. That's interesting. Well, we, I, I've always been hitting lands on this with no problem. Yeah, but but I mean, it's a good point um they were two juarez disruptions it's something to flex in there yeah. another I and mean, we got other cards that we could utilize too you could utilize valor stance in this deck as mm -hmm. well and the fading hopes there's there are a ton of possibilities with this deck but i think i'm gonna probably tinker around with it a little bit yeah, now that yeah. i've gone over the list a couple of times in my head and uh I will definitely put out a new list when I take this out for a spin, but uh, we'll get to what I think is going to happen. Yeah, in go just for a it. Second. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, because I know we're getting close to the end here, so you go right ahead. Yep. So uh, for just as a board sweeper, we got burned down the house. Uh, we can drop it in and make, create the three one one red devils where they get to do one damage whenever they die as well. However, burn down the house is probably the best sweeper to have for me with inside this deck. You could do Doom Scar, but Doom Scar doesn't hit Planeswalkers. And if you've ever seen a card that can absolutely annihilate a loss quicker than anything, yeah. It's burn down the house. So good. Burn down the house wrecks Loth. Loth has, and I think Loth is the best planeswalker in standard. We, I haven't tested Obnixilis yet with the chariot yeah, yeah. copy. That's going to be fun. But uh, yeah, burn down the house will absolutely annihilate Loth. So we just, we, we're not really looking to maintain board state as much with this deck and the fading hopes would probably definitely help just to kind of delay and that's where we're going we're trying to delay just get to that turn five and six and then it's just game over it's done unless they've got counters and they test the talents the perfect cards and stuff like that it's just going to be game over with the with the uh triomes coming out and how um prevalent i think aggro is going to be i don't think we're going to see too many test of talents running around agreed so and then the land package is just pretty standard i mean we I, you can copy and paste it there's no creature lands in this uh, i did have a hall of the storm giants but more often than not i hit that thing and had to lay it down sideways when it would have been crucial to have an untapped land yeah. and it just frustrated me and it's not a win con in this guys it's not you if you want it in there as a backup win con you can but more often than not if i'm not running this deck i'm running two or three field of runes and i'm going to kill your one hall of the storm giant yeah so it wasn't prevalent enough of it uh, or it wasn't uh, reliable enough for me to even stick in here. It was actually skewing my mana curve a little bit because I, I hit it at the most inopportune times more often than <laughs> I hit it perfectly. So Hall of the Storm Giants was gone. And I absolutely love Hall. I absolutely yeah. love Hall. But uh, yeah, so overall, like I said, I think one one or two slip out the backs could be a flex and you could put in a couple of fading hopes i think it resolves that great uh, point with that it's just being able to kind of reset your uh, opponent's board stay a little bit and make them uh you know push their mana back out just to recast to uh, build up their board state uh boon of safety is still something i'm looking for but i like this more than i do valor stance because it's protecting our creatures and uh you know you can put it on your creature and block something and kill it and just remove the shield counter and your creature's still fine so yeah. i think it flexes better than valor stance to me and i may be looking for a way to put it in a second one 
Um, the abrades you could probably turn into synerclasms if you just want an early mono white board wipe, which it usually hits everything mono white on turn three when you would cast it for its uh, two damage across the board. It'll usually clear up mono white's board state pretty quickly. Um, and then the negates, you know, you could probably flex in the two Juarez disruptions back in here. I don't think that hurts at all. Uh, I actually like Juarez disruption. Negate was just me trying to stabilize against uh, just big sweepers like yeah. um, the blood on the snows, the doom scars, farewell, stuff like that. And uh, but again, until we understand meta, I don't know where these flexors are going to go. And it's going to take at least a week, maybe two for us to uh, actually understand what cream of the crop is going to float to the top here with the uh, meta. So don't yeah. know yet, but I'm definitely probably dropping Lear down to two <laughs> and putting in the fourth unexpected windfall because the unexpected windfall and the big scores are the cards that we absolutely have to hit. And that's always what held this deck up was trying to find one of the four unexpected windfalls. Well, now we got to try and find one of the eight <laughs> unexpected <laughs> windfalls. Um, yeah. Here's where I'm going, just in summary with this. I think with all the cards that we have and, and treasures just being more prevalent across the state of the game in general, um, I think somebody is going to, I don't know that this list that I end up with is going to be the best list. I think somebody's going to end up with the best list. And uh, I think between big score, unexpected windfall, and gold span dragon, and with everything else we got going on with treasures, I am going to go ahead and go on the record and predict Goldspan Dragon ends up banned quicker than All Runs Epiphany. I would not be terribly surprised. Um, I think between a number of different decks, but certainly the two that we featured here today, <laughs> um, which, you know, on on a new format rotation you know, obviously there are certain decks that are, or certain cards or decks that are always going to kind of rise to the top, but Goldspan Dragon has been towards the top for a long time, mm -hmm. and it just got better, in my yeah. opinion. Um, it's very rare that you, in my opinion, that you see a card like that just continuously kind of skew upwards. Um, generally, there's something that comes along that can deal with it, or you know, people get into a new set, obviously new players come into the game, and so you get a lot more people trying to be like, oh, we're going to kill it, and the meta will adjust. It's going to be difficult to do that, because it it inherently does so much. Uh, while it doesn't actually protect itself super well, we've got cheap ways to do that, <laughs> but it also, it also leaves something behind with the treasure token aspect of it in a way that makes it really easy to like utilize its abilities right away and and get something going and so um it's just one of those things that's really tricky to deal with and it it's gonna be good i mean it it, it has been good and it will continue to be so i'm curious as well i'm not sure if it'll get banned or not i think this deck will be the thing that or, or whatever iteration of this deck hits the top of the meta i think that's mm -hmm. gonna be the like the thing that sets it over the top though because every other deck utilizes it really well but it's a piece of a much bigger puzzle whereas here it's the finisher right like that's right that's the way you win between other cards of course but it's a combo piece well and i don't necessarily know that the card's good enough to get banned by itself right i'll agree with that I do think that this card is going to see over 50% of the field is going to yeah. be utilizing Goldspan Dragon. And that's usually when they start taking notice. I think not necessarily the reprint, <laughs> but the print of yeah. Big Score is going to be what pushes it into uh, the ban category. And um, before I forget, too, you were talking about uh, protection and stuff. Uh, just another trick with this deck before I forget for anybody wanting to try it. Uh, you can attack in with gold span and create your treasure for that turn if you're just a couple mana short of starting your combo and still hit it with show of confidence before it hits the opposing player because yes. you're all your, all your triggers are going off of instance by then. And the uh, so, the don't, step, yeah, yeah, so yeah. definitely don't forget that you can attack in and just create a couple extra mana if that's all you needed to get this com uh, combo rolling. But yeah, man, I honestly I think. Um, I think big score, and I mean, it's not just big score. Big score is the big part that I think is going to put a bullseye on gold span. However, there's so much going on with treasures now 
yeah. in this set that uh, being able to double the amount is yeah. just absolutely, it's absolutely insane. It's I agree. Absolutely insane. I think they, it's... They, I mean, um, what's, the, what's the one card? I play it in Commander all the time. Extra Planar Lens. Extra Planar? Yeah. Extra planar, extra, extra planar lens. I mean, there's a reason why I've got a deck that's just mono snow colored forest. <laughs> Cause I'll play it and you exile a card, a yeah. land card, and that, well, nobody else is playing snow covered forest, but it duplicates all my forest. Yeah. You know, and I get to tap for two mana. And it just, the deck just throws everything on the field before an opponent can even respond to it. And yep. I think that's what we're going to see with gold span, big score and unexpected windfall all setting in standard right now. Yep. I think, I, I mean, I have, I have no disagreements there. I think we're absolutely going to see it, uh, hit in a lot of different places. The two decks that we've created being a couple of them. Um, but it hits in so many different decks already that it's almost difficult to imagine a, a standard without it at this point. I think my question will end up being, depending on how the meta ends up shaping up, is Goldspan mm. Dragon, you know, say it, it it does take over 50% of the meta versus a, a multitude of decks that it's in. Is Goldspan Dragon the card that gets banned or is another card like Show of Confidence, as silly as that sounds, is that the card get, that gets banned? Um, just to shut this deck down, but not shut every deck down. Um, and you know, that's, that's not something that we can speculate all day, but that's not likely the answer. I, I have no clue what it will be. It may just be to ban Goldspan Dragon, which is fine. Um, and it may not even happen. We could be completely wrong. <laughs> no, you got a good point. It could be show of confidence. Show of confidence is actually what breaks this deck wide open, but I still think I think man, just does so I think much. I think big score. I think they really messed up on that because yeah, I am seeing yeah. it as the biggest score <laughs> in this set. <laughs> I am. Yeah. I love it. All puns intended. Yes. It is, it is by. It, I didn't even. I mentioned it when we were talking about it last week in the podcast, but I didn't select it because yeah. it's just the obvious. I think the strongest card coming obvious, out of this yeah. set right now is big score. And the only reason it's the strongest right now is because of Goldspan Dragon. I agree. Um, well, Country Fried, I will say yeah. this deck looks great. I appreciate your, you. your input here because I do really like this deck. I think you touched on a lot of really important points that we're going to need to keep an eye out on. Uh, when we go into this new meta or as we're going into this new meta. And again, those flex slots here, I think, are really crucial because the meta is going to determine what those end up being, and that's an ever-shifting platform. So you're going to constantly be having to consider, you know, different different options in those spots. So uh, all that to say, I do agree. I think this is going to be an absolutely killer deck. I love the upgrades yeah. you've made to it, so I'm I'm stoked to get my hands on it. Guys, uh, as a reminder, um, now that we're kind of wrapping up the decks here, if you guys mm -hmm. do want to try these out for yourselves, you can do so. The links are down below. Uh, you can check those out. You can play around with them, see what kinds of changes you want to make, what kinds of tweaks you want to make. And if you do happen to make any, feel free to share those with us in the comment section so we can take a look and see what we think uh, and, and open up that discussion because we'd absolutely love to talk to you guys about that. So uh, with that, though, we're coming to the end step. Yeah. I shouldn't say that because that, that's another podcast that says that. So, <laughs> okay. Copyright. We don't own that. Um, but <laughs> uh, we're coming to the end of this one. Uh, all this to say, though, new set looking great. I'm excited to play mm -hmm. around with it. But uh, as a quick, because we have been going for a little while now, over almost an hour and 20 minutes. Yeah, we didn't plan on that. We didn't. We thought this was going to be a short episode, and we here got, we are. We got to quit talking, man. We well, do. I guess that's why. That's why we got a podcast now. Yeah, exactly. Because we just, we just ramble know, all day. That's all we do. It's easy to feed you. Feed me with little nuggets as we go <laughs> along, man, and I just can't stop myself. It just keeps going. But yeah, let's see. Here we go again. Go. Well, see, in truth, this is what we do all day anyway. We just happen yeah. to now record it so other people yeah. can get it. No, uh, so at the end of the podcast episode we set the precedence that we each get to tell a little story uh at the end something non-magic related so if you are looking just solely for magic content you did it well done you can leave bye yep uh thanks for stopping in yeah appreciate it um so i don't have a great story but what i will say um and i don't know that you well yeah i think you know this um 
I have a fairly substantial like paper. This is magic related. I'm cheating a little bit. I have a substantial magic paper collection. Well, yeah, I know this. It's in the background of your camera when we talk. Yeah, man. you it's... got whole walls of binders. Well, so here's my thing. <laughs> yeah, so I used to set collect, and I've been doing the collection update series, which is a blast. Mm -hmm. Super encourage anybody to go check that out. But um, what I've been doing is like trimming down on my collection because a it's not practical. <laughs> um, but b I've also I used to collect a playset of literally every card in existence like that was my goal uh which i've now realized is a stupid goal because a i don't have the room for it and b i don't have the time to do all that so um i'm trimming down on my collection and i have gone through and realized i had so many cards i didn't even remember that i had as an example because i have a little sorting tray back here i have a mm -hmm. foil OG. I have a sorting hat. What you did you say? A <laughs> no, sorting okay. thing behind me. You can't <laughs> yeah. see this, but I have a foil right. OG Koth of the Hammer mm -hmm. that I completely forgot I had. And like, that's oh, not man. a crazy, ridiculous card, but I just love it. It's awesome. Don't even edit this out. Okay. What am I not editing out? Keep going. Oh, crap. I'm alone. Hi, everybody. We got other cards too. Um, I'm just realizing how many other cards I had that I really had no clue that were there. It's really fun to to go through old collections and stuff. All right, he's back. We did it. Right on. What is this that you have? Oh no, man, so you talked about magic cards. I didn't have anything really exciting either. Okay. I'm gonna talk about mine. I've told this story on my stream last night. Somebody brought up Glissa. Okay. Oh yeah. So getting into uh magic. Way back in the day. Well, no, I guess it was only about like 2009, 2010. Yeah, I've known say. about it forever. Yeah, yeah. I went the route of Highlander wanting to win the sword. And what a really horrible investment because I could have had Black Lotuses. But uh, um, I, got, I got into it probably around 2009, 2010 with a really cutthroat group of commander players, which I absolutely love in Austin, Texas. Yeah. And I mean, I wouldn't suggest cutthroat commander, but... It's really, it's, it's trial by fire yeah, and yeah. that's how you can learn really fast. But, uh, my first commander was Omnath, just green Omnath. Mm -hmm. And then my first multicolored commander was Glissa, Glissa yeah. the trader. And, uh, we went to, we went to the Austin Grand Prix. Um, I want to say it was 2010. Okay. And, uh, and, um, RK Post was there, and I got a bunch of artwork done by him while I was there. And the play mat for that was the RK Post uh, mm -hmm. play mat. But, uh, I mean, back then, that's where the pros went when they played and stuff. So we got to meet a lot of pros. I got to meet Kibler. Oh, sick. And if you don't know, it's Brian Kibler. Yeah. And Brian Kibler is the Dragon Master. So people are always walking up to him and asking him to sign dragons and stuff like that. Well, we ran into each other during this Grand Prix, and I was like, hey, dude. I need you to sign this card for me, if you don't mind. And he was like, yeah, sure. What do you got? And I pulled it out. <laughs> and, <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'm so excited for this. This is my first commander. Yes. Listen. Move to your left a hair. Okay, never mind. What's that? <laughs> Nothing. You're good. <laughs> what it was a little to the right so it was cutting off a little bit but oh, it's the dude, it's the yeah. pre-release promo of glissa right yeah yeah boom right with there. brian kibler oh and japanese yes heck yes 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 and he looked at me and it took him a second he was he wasn't sure if he was signing it first he's like <laughs> uh, what's this and i was like well this is my first commander i'd like you to sign it if you don't mind he's like yeah i'm just not used to signing that kind of stuff it's usually dragons and i was like yeah but that's my kibler elf dude that's so sick. <laughs> so really my quick, kibler elf <laughs> i'm trying to find so for those of you who don't know and again i know country fried you can't see this but uh, -huh. uh i have a four row ultra pro binder that's just full of promos that's so, your flex because yeah, mine are only three flex. So it's literally just like play sets of just tons of stuff that I really like. But, and I actually just flipped to it, um, one of my all-time favorite pre-release promos is that Glissa. And I have nice. a play set of them in English, and they're not signed, 
But I do have a playset of these, and I absolutely love this card. Glissa, yeah. I read the novels, and it's if you don't know, it's all about Glissa, the mm -hmm. original uh, Mirrodin cycle. Um, yeah. And it was super sick. So I, I got to read it, man. I got to read it. I got to be a better content creator and start learning the lore. Uh, I keep telling my community I'm going to do that. But yeah, my my actual mouse pad on the side of my desk. <laughs> uh, yeah is that card and oh, that's steve, awesome steve argyle knocked it out of the park with that one yeah, steve did. argyle just absolutely killed it with the artwork on that i mean don't get me wrong the, the, the original is great but the promo is just absolutely stunning absolutely. it's the it's the only it's the, other than the harley from joker and harley that i got on my leg <laughs> it is the only artwork of a female that my wife has told me that i could actually go get on my other leg are you serious <laughs> yes <laughs> that's funny because she's like yeah she's bad she's yeah. bad she's she sick, is dude. man for sure it does it's kind of got that hr geiger feel from yeah, aliens yeah, yeah. and stuff in it man it's for just sure. absolutely beautiful it's stunning i love it man sick dude i'm such an artwork nerd oh i am too <laughs> i love the artwork i don't know artist names super well but like mm -hmm. artwork is a huge reason why i collect it's it's just I don't, so fun <laughs> I don't either, unless it's just the ones that I fix on, fixate on, like Avatar yeah, Woes, yeah. RK Post, Darken's got one of the, uh, what is it, the Vampiric Tutor Darken one, yeah, um, and then Steve Argyle's Gliss and stuff like that, man. And I and I met Darken there; he was at the same event, oh, so cool. I got to meet RK Post and Darken, and uh, and RK Post's Avatar Woe is yeah. a Harlequin. Yeah, and yeah. and I got him to draw that on the play mat. And then I was like, and now here's another 50 bucks. I need you to do a Joker. And he's like, what? <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like, <laughs> he's like, I've never even done Joker. I was like, you got a, you got a phone. And I think it was a flip phone at the time. Heck Motorola yes. flip phone. Yeah, it is. And he pulled it up and he did it for me, man. Real accommodating. Everybody's super cool at these events, man. Yeah, now yeah. that we're out of the COVID and we've got a whole bunch of new players because of Arena, if you're listening to this and you've never been to a, like a, a Grand Prix or one of these mass events and stuff and you're comfortable with it, um, then I would definitely say give it a shot. There's just a lot of trading going on there. There's a lot of cool people. And, you know, you may meet one out of five or one out of ten that's just you know you're put off by but you will meet a huge yeah. huge interesting crowd and you get to meet the artist and you get to meet the pros and you get to meet the collectors and you just you know it's a great I've place i've never been to a large size like large scale event i've been to a couple oh of and a pre-release or two i i'm very anti-social fun fact <laughs> i am too um but Super. dude when the next grand prix gets i don't know when it is or when the next one we'd be able to go to is but you and i should like meet up and go and like just have a blast dude i think it'd be fun yeah we'll definitely have to try and fix something up man because that was the other thing i i'm super and i and i get crowd anxiety yeah, a lot sure. so you'll see me i'll come in and spend maybe 20 30 minutes and then i gotta go away yeah, for yeah, a yeah, yeah. While. i'm with you on that for sure. um and, and, but <laughs> man if it's it's like the disney world of magic man yeah that's the thing that's <laughs> why i want to go but like i never had the opportunity sweet. and because i'm antisocial and i'm not agoraphobic and i'm not making fun of agoraphobic yeah. people mm -mm. but i work from home um which is part of why i can do like the youtube channel stuff and all that and because i've started working from home in the last couple of years i just like don't want to leave i'm just like nah yeah. i'm good caitlin no. caitlin will be like hey do you want to go for dinner i'm like nah i'm good thanks <laughs> Oh, yeah, no, I feel it. Mine's got a lot to do with the probably a little more to do with the military and stuff like yes, that. Yeah, and yeah. The, a lot of the deployments that we did and stuff like that. And it just, you know, military treats you, uh, trains you in a bunch of stuff that just ends up ingrained in you. Yeah, for whether, sure. Whether you want it to happen or not, you know, like crowd surfing and stuff like that, not to get into too many details, yes. but just, you know, threat detections and stuff like that, whether you even think there is any or not. And it's not that you're trying to do it, but, uh, yeah. and that just bumps up my anxiety because then I recognize that I'm doing it and I don't want to do it. Yeah. I don't want to be that person anymore. I don't have to be that person anymore. And it's still just, you know, it's something that I'm trying to deal with. And, you know, I don't know that I'll ever be able to deal with it hundred percent, but I did go with, I did go with a group of friends and yeah. it helped. It helped. Okay. I, I went with like three or four people and it helped a lot. So uh, it was really fun, man. We had standard and there was historic and commander pods going on. And it was the release of Innistrad with okay. uh, really expensive Liliana. Of the veil. Yeah, there you go. And uh, 
I think we won like three foils of her and commander oh, pods dude. and then turned around and sold them for like 150 bucks a piece and paid yeah. for the whole trip because yeah, we yeah. just, we all just manned up and slept on the floor in one hotel room. And yeah, dude, just you gotta do what, what you gotta do. It was a blast, man. It was a blast. We'll so. we'll uh we'll do that, dude. That'd be a blast. Yeah. We'll we'll find one that we can we can both get to at a time that works for us and we'll see if we can make that happen. Cause I really would like to go. I think that'd be an awesome time. Maybe we'll do yeah. a little glorious sunrise meetup while we're there, if people there still like go. the show by then. <laughs> Yeah, I hope so. I hope so. I'm loving it, man, because we do. We, we It's hard to even record sometimes because we'll try. We'll start talking. Yeah, we'll just, just keep talking. <laughs> it's the length of the episodes. But uh, yeah, dude, this has been Rapid. an absolute Rapid. blast, guys. Thank you so much for watching this episode. Again, share your deck list. Share your ideas for these deck lists if you would like to. I hope you guys are enjoying the new set. By the time this comes out, you'll have had the weekend to, to enjoy it. Um, but we really do appreciate any and all support. Don't forget, you can listen on the spot on Spotify and the podcast app if you would like to. You can go ahead and follow there. Uh, but guys, thank you so much. If you're watching on YouTube, go sub to Country Fried, please. He's a phenomenal content creator, does a lot of live streams, all kinds of great stuff. So go hang out with him. But until next time, guys, it's been a glorious day.